there's a lot younger fauna in some places in the area too, uh, from the Pleistocene era. And uh, our speaker is uh, Mr. Stan Dean, who is a uh, former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Xavier University and uh, currently Professor Emeritus of Biology. Uh, he's also on the advisory board at the uh, Museum Center and has authored a couple of uh, books, one of which is for sale over there, the uh, uh, Natural History of the Cincinnati Region, and also one on Big Bone Lick that uh, is going to be our newest topic tonight. Okay. that were at the last museum lecture, you might want to leave right now because it's going to be pretty much what I talked about uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so, review that. The other thing, uh, I don't have any books with me, but uh, the people that published the book, the University Press of Kentucky, asked me when I go out and speak to, you know, put these out. So if you're interested in uh, purchasing a book, uh, here is some information on that. And I'll just put that over here uh, by the books, I guess. So feel free to grab one of those if you're interested. Okay. Everything I need to say is up on the screen. So uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm back. Got to cover. <laughs> That's the boomerang that will not come back. Yeah. Uh, big bone lick. Best way to start talking about any topic. I taught at Xavier for 38 years, so. Uh, good. <laughs> Another former student who's happy I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> a good way to start find the terms. So here we have a big bone lick. Uh, a lick, let's start, let's go back, let's start with a lick. Uh, a lick, of course, as you all know, refers to the fact that there are places across the world uh, in which salt comes to the surface and uh, herbivores, herbivorous animals, mammals, uh, come to these places in order to get their potion to salt. If you're a carnivorous animal or an omnivorous animal, uh, you really don't need to get salt. You get it through your diet, uh, through the meat portion of your diet. If you're a herbivorous mammal, however, uh, your plant diet is not enough to, to give you the salt that you need as an animal. And uh, so everywhere in the world, there has to be some source of salt uh, if there is uh, some herbiv herbivorous mammal fauna there. Uh, there is a lot of salt at uh, Big Bone Lake shown on this diagram, for those of you who have not been down there, to show you where it is. Uh, it's about 20, 25 miles uh, from where you're sitting up here in the Cincinnati area. Uh, the lick is there because obviously there are faults in the Earth's crust, and up those faults, up those cracks in the underlying uh, Ordovician uh, rock, it comes, comes salt-laden water. Well, let's call it brine. Um, for those of you who don't, and of course most people in this room know this diagram uh, as well as any diagram they've ever known, uh, but, but for those of you who might be new to this game, uh, if you take a cross section starting here in Peebles, Ohio, and go through, let's say, Florence, Kentucky, and over through North Vernon, Indiana, uh, you cross the Ohio River, as you can see a couple times, um, and, and then you look at the geological cross section that, that you get from that, and uh, you'll find that underneath uh, where you're sitting, uh, the, whole, the whole Cincinnati area, is uh, Ordovician rock. Um, below that is uh, Cambrian or, or pre-Ordovician uh, rock. Uh, and among those rock layers, both the Ordovician and the, and the uh, Cambrian, uh, there are certain layers that do contain a, a good deal of salt. Uh, these are old oceanic, oceanic layers, of course, from the Ordovician seas, from the Cambrian seas. Uh, at some times, those, uh, those, during those periods, uh, there was some shallowness, or there may have been a salt flat or even a beach uh, on which the salt water then would get up uh, and with evaporation, 
you would get salt crystals perhaps. Um, in any case, there are some decent salt layers down there. And when water percolates down through those areas and then comes back up in an artesian fashion, uh, like a big bone lick, uh, it, it brings the salt back up to the surface, and that's what gives the salt licks. Now, what I'm not showing on that map are the, a whole bunch of other licks in the area. Uh, mostly in this room, probably have some lick located near, near where you live. Uh, maybe not there anymore, but the geographic name is still there. Uh, because many of these licks have dried out as we've changed our, our land surf surface uses. Uh, at Big Bone Lake, there is still uh, uh, quite a few salt springs active, and if you go down there and take a walk around, you can come uh, on the interpretive path to one of them <coughs> and, and see what these licks actually, uh, actually look like. Okay, so much for the lake portion of this. Now let's get to the more interesting portion for you paleontologists, and that's the Big Bone, uh, and let's go right to a big bone. Uh, that, that bone is uh, about 40 inches in length. The reason I picked that is because that's the first bone that left the lick on its way to a museum somewhere. Uh, in 1739, a French military party on its way from Canada down to help out uh, the other French folks down in New Orleans uh, had to come through this part of, the, of North America and uh, took the Ohio River, of course, as, as, as the early explorers did in this region. Uh, the Indian guides uh, showed them over to Big Bone Lick as a source maybe of salt, which Indians had been getting there for centuries, uh, or more likely uh, as a source of meat, because all these elk and, and bison and, and deer uh, were congregating around the lick, just like animals had for, as far as we know, thousands upon thousands of years. And uh, so the Indians knew it as a, as a great source of meat, uh, and it certainly would, would bring the military party they were guiding over, perhaps to procure some of that meat. As I said, maybe also to procure, procure some salt. Um, the, the French military party was kind of amazed at what they found there, these, these huge bones lying around the surface of the ground. Uh, the Indians had known about them for, again, we don't know how long, centuries, uh, eons, who knows. Uh, but, but the French military party picked up some of these bones, uh, took them with, to their battles in, in the south against the Chickasaw, uh, and, and then on to New Orleans, and uh, the commander then uh, loaded some of these bones on a boat and accompanied them over to France and gave them to the king of France, who promptly put them in the uh, Natural History Museum. So, next time you're in Paris, you know, uh, stop in at the Natural History Museum in Paris, and there you you'll have a paleontological specimen right from your own collecting area, uh, sitting right there on the wall, uh, advertised as, as Big Bone Lake. Uh, that's not the only piece that, that uh, went out and ended up in France. Several pieces did. Here's a jawbone with a couple of six, seven pound teeth in them. Uh, these teeth are, are quite amazing things, much like our molars, but, but, but certainly much larger as well. Um, so you have bones, you have teeth, uh, you have some kind of curved structures which were taken uh, and to this day are still found, of course, uh, at the lake. Uh, these, these, these curved structures are the ones that the Indians really were interested in. Not that the Indians ever collected any of these things, because uh, it was kind of sacred ground to them. Uh, because they thought that the lake was the last resting place of the uh, giant bison, the great bison, whatever you want to call it. Um, say, well, how did they get a bison out of this? Well, you got to remember the Indians have never seen an elephant. So when they see a tusk like this, they have no conception of what an animal like an elephant would have um, as an external incisor, is kind of what the elephant tusk is. Uh, the, only, the only structure that they could think of that they had seen uh, in, in their own livelihoods uh, was, of course, the horn of a bison. So they took these eight, nine, ten foot tusks and they imagine them to be the horns of huge bison, which makes a lot of sense because that also explains these huge femurs, these huge bones, these huge teeth. And, 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 and uh, the Indian understanding of, of these bones that were found there at, at, at the lake, and as far as I know, were always there, uh, was that this was the final resting place of the, of the very feared giant bison of their mythology. And the reason there were so many bones there is because the great spirit to protect the Indian nation uh, came down there one fine day and uh, threw lightning bolts at all of the uh, existing giant bison and killed them all. 
And that's why there are so many of these huge bones and huge teeth, and in their mind, huge horns. Uh, which, of course, the French military party immediately looked at and said, those aren't horns, those are elephant tusks. And, uh, because the French knew of these, had seen them in zoos, and museums, and books, etc., etc., uh, knew of the modern elephants in, in Asia and in Africa. So, 